Samuel yet. Let me pray for us as we come to 1 Samuel. Lord and Heavenly Father, we thank you for this, your word. Uh, Father, we pray that by your spirit you would speak to us now through it. Uh, Father, give us ears to hear what you have to say to us. Um, and Father, be working and changing us uh, week by week as we meet you in your word. Amen. Amen. We're going we're gonna to do things a little bit differently in some ways today, um, partly because the passage and the reading is actually massive. So today runs basically from the start of chapter 9 till verse um, 16 um, of, um, of chapter 10. And so we're going to do today's sermon a little bit like the Puritans used to preach their sermons. I don't know if you know much about the Puritans, but they they were kind of in the late 16th century, um, English preachers particularly. Um, And they used to preach by reading the passage as they went. So they'd read a section of the passage, make some comments on it, read the next section, make some comments on it, and then tie it together um, at the end. And it works quite well for long passages like this, so you just don't get lost um, in all the text. We will do something slightly differently, though, because the Puritans were known for kind of going on a bit in their sermons. So they were often given egg timers to have on their lectern. They were hour-long egg timers they were given. And the general rule was they could turn it over twice, but if they got to three times, they were rambling on a bit too long. Um, But we'll try and keep it a little more concise than the kind of three-hour limit that they used used to put on it. If you've not been with us in 1 Samuel, we've got to a point in the book where God's people, they're looking and wanting a king to rule over them. And we're waiting here for the first king of Israel to kind of arrive on the scene. Um, And it's a bit of an odd point in the book, because up to this point, we've seen actually how God has been the king they needed, that God is the king that we all need. Um, God has been the one for them who has rescued them, He's given them the land that they're living in. He's defeated the enemies that were coming over the border to attack them. And he's pushed them back. He's roared with thunder from the mountaintops and driven them away. He's given them peace and security. But for God's people here at this point in 1 Samuel, it's never quite been enough. They've kind of looked at the nations and the other countries around them and gone, we want a king a bit like their king. We want a leader, someone to rule us, to be strong, someone to defend us. I think we can understand that in some ways. Because sometimes it's easier, isn't it, when you've got someone in front of you to be a kind of leader or a figurehead who you can see who's there. And it's easier to trust and follow them, perhaps, than it is God, who we can't see. And in the run-up to this chapter, God has warned them that if they choose a human king, a person over him, then it won't end well. They can have one or the other. They can have God as their king or they can have a person. And if they have a human king, then that would be a king who in the end would exploit them, would take the best of all they had, their children, their servants, the money they get in, and build their own empire. But yet somewhere God's people say, no, we want a king. We don't want you, God. We want a king. And so today, as we hit 1 Samuel chapter 9, on page 231, if you've got the church Bibles, the question is, what sort of king are they going to get? And we meet a man called Saul. So let me read you the first two verses of chapter 9, the start of our reading. There was a man of Benjamin whose name was Kish, the son of Abiel, son of Zeror, uh, I've lost my way. Son of Kish, son, son of Becheroth, son of Aphia, a Benjaminite, a man of wealth. And he had a son whose name was Saul, a handsome young man. There was not a man among the people of Israel more handsome than he. From his shoulders upwards, he was taller than any of the people. This is Saul, and we meet Saul, and Saul, as you read this, you realise he's very much a big fish, very literally, but in all sorts of other ways, in a very small pond. He's a bit of a man of two halves. I mean, he looks like a leader, he's handsome, more beautiful than anybody else around, and he's tall, taller than anyone around. I don't know if you know this, but when we choose our leaders, we tend to pick people who are tall. If you're a tall man, you have a good chance of becoming a leader in something. 
And the guard, there was an experiment done, and the Guardian reported it about 10 years ago, whereby they got people to draw leaders. And they always drew them much taller than they really are, and much taller than the average person. And when you ask people to pick, who do you think out of this group looks like a leader? They'll pick the tall, good-looking men of, of them. Um, I don't know if you noticed Rishi Shunak's trousers recently. Um, there's been some interesting reporting on his trousers. Because um, if you notice, now he has lots of money, so he buy, his suits aren't off the peg. They're well tailored, so they're exactly as they're meant to be. And if you look, they finish like partway up his shins almost. Um, and apparently, so it goes, and so we're told, it's because he's quite short. But actually, it makes you look taller. It's an old tailoring trick to make you look taller. You have your trousers that finish slightly short. Because everyone thinks you're wearing regular length trousers, so you must be really tall if they finish short. So next time we see a photo, look at his trousers. They always finish halfway up his leg. Because he's a leader, and he's quite short, and it makes him look taller to the cameras. Well, that's Saul, although he doesn't need the short trousers. Saul looks like a leader, the kind of person we'd want to be king, the kind of king that Israel has been dreaming of. But then we get the other half of him, don't we? Did you pick out that line? It comes back later in our reading, too, that he's a Benjaminite. He's from the tribe of Benjamin. That might not mean much to us, but it would have meant something to them then. Because the tribe of Benjamin, it was the smallest tribe. It was the least significant tribe. You don't pick your kings from the tribe of Benjamin. If Israel were choosing their own king, it wouldn't have been Saul. This is a moment where God breaks the mold, and we'll see little bits of that happening. Because as we read this, I think we're supposed to wonder in these first two verses, is there a hint of God working slightly differently here? Is there a nudge towards God choosing a slightly different kind of king that's not just like the rest of the world's kings? At this point, I don't think we're supposed to know. But it's just a niggle that should be left hanging. But what was Saul? What was Saul, this king, supposed to be like, aside from tall and handsome? Well, Saul, we see, as we come on to our next little bit of the reading, was a man who was willing to seek God, even if it was primarily about some lost donkeys. Because when we meet Saul, he's on a journey to try and find some donkeys that have gone for a wander. It's a bit comical in some ways. They come back again and again, all through, and he's lost donkeys. But it's a picture of a son seeking to serve and honour his father by going to find the donkeys. And it brings Saul and Samuel the prophet into each other's orbits. Read with me. I'm going to read from verse 3 to verse 14, the next chunk of our reading. Now the donkeys of Kish, Saul's father, were lost. So Kish said to Saul, his son, take one of the young men with you and arise and go and look for the donkeys. And he passed through the hill country of Ephraim and passed through the land of Shalishah, but they did not find them. And they passed through the land of Shalim, but they were not there. Then they passed through the land of Benjamin, but did not find them. When they came to the land of Zuf, Saul said to his servant who was with him, Come, let us go back, lest my father cease to care about the donkeys and become anxious about us. But he said to him, Behold, there is a man of God in this city, and he is a man who is held in honour. All that he says comes true. So now let us go there. Perhaps he can tell us where we should go. Then Saul said to his servant, But if we go, what can we bring the man? For the bread in our sacks is gone, and there is no present to bring the man of God. What do we have? The servant answered Saul again, Here, I have with me a quarter of a shekel of silver, and I will give it to the man of God to tell us our way. Formerly in Israel, when a man went to inquire of God, he said, Come, let us go to the seer. For today's prophet was formerly called a seer. And Saul said to his servant, well said, come, let us go. So they went to the city where the man of God was. And as they went up the hill to the city, they met young women coming out to draw water and said to them, is the seer here? They answered, he is, behold, he is just ahead of you, hurry. He has come just now to the city because the people have a sacrifice today on the high place. As soon as you enter the city, you will find him before he goes up to the high place to eat. For the people will not eat till he comes, since you must bless the sacrifice. Afterwards, those who are invited will eat. Now go up, for you'll meet him immediately. So they went up to the city. As they were entering the city, they saw Samuel coming out towards them on his way up to the high place. It is the servant, you'll notice, who suggests that they go and see Samuel, a seer, a man of God, someone who might be able to tell them where to go or what to do. And having found something to take him, because it would have been rude to turn up with no gift and no present, you always took something with you. Saul and his servant, they head off to the city to find 
the man of God. And with the help of the young women, they find and come across Samuel. There's a little line here, I think worth noting in what we read, that the people won't eat the sacrifice until Samuel comes to bless it. They will wait for Samuel, for the prophet, the man of God. The reason that's significant, just lodge it in your brain, because in three short chapters, Saul won't wait for Samuel to come and bless the sacrifice. That suddenly will mark a change in Saul, where he starts out like a king, with no other king above him. But for now, we don't know that. For now, the people are waiting, and Saul is off to find Samuel. Here we have Saul, a man who is willing to seek after God, seek after his will. He consults with God's prophet. At this point, it bodes really quite well. Perhaps Saul will be a king after God's own heart. For Saul, he was a man willing to seek after God. But he was also a man who was chosen very specifically by God. And in everything that follows, we mustn't forget that. So let's keep reading the next 10 verses from verse 15. Follow with me. Now, the day before Saul came, the Lord had revealed to Samuel, Tomorrow, about this time, I will send to you a man from the land of Benjamin, and you shall anoint him to be prince over my people Israel. He shall save my people from the hand of the Philistines, for I have seen my people, because their cry has come to me. When Samuel saw Saul, the Lord told him, Here is the man whom I spoke to you. He it is who shall restrain my people. Then Saul approached Samuel in the gate and said, Tell me, where is the house of the seer? Samuel answered Saul, I am the seer. Go up before me to the high place, for today you shall eat with me, and in the morning I will let you go and will tell you all that is on your mind. As for your donkeys that were lost three days ago, do not set your mind on them, for they have been found. And for whom is all that is desirable in Israel? Is it not for you and all your father's house? Saul answered, Am I not a Benjaminite from the least of the tribes of Israel? And is not my clan the humblest of all the clans of the tribe of Benjamin? Why have you spoken to me in this way? Then Samuel took Saul and his young man and brought them into the hall and gave them a place at the head of those who had been invited, who were about 30 persons. And Samuel said to the cook, Bring the portion I gave you, of which I said you put it aside. So the, took, so the cook took up the leg and what was on it and set it before Saul. And Samuel said, See, what was kept is set before you, eat, because it was kept for you until the hour appointed, that you might eat with the guests. So Saul ate with Samuel that day. And when they came down from the high place into the city, a bed was spread for Saul on the roof, and he lay down to sleep. Saul was one very clearly chosen by God. And it's worth remembering that as we carry on through 1 Samuel. Even before Saul turns up at the gate of the city that day, God has already spoken to Samuel. And Samuel knows that Saul is coming that God has chosen him. There's an echo here, isn't there? I don't know if you heard it, but there's an echo of the Exodus where God hears his people cry and sends someone to rescue them, to lead them, a prince over them. In that case, back in the Exodus from Egypt, it was Moses. In this case, we have Saul. And Saul, he seems to know, doesn't he? When he meets Samuel, he seems to know that actually it's really unlikely that he would ever be the one who would be made king or ruler or prince over Israel. He's from the tribe of Benjamin. It's brought up for a second time. But also in those 10 verses, we had a little bit of an insight into what Saul will do as king. Firstly, he will be a prince. The word is literally a ruler over Israel. In that sense, he will be the one that replaces God. God used to be the one who led Israel, but actually now Saul will. God used to show them the way to go, tell them which was right and wrong. Now that mantle will pass in some way to Saul, to a man. Secondly, he'll be the one who saves them from the Philistines. He'll be a man of military power. The responsibility for protecting and guarding Israel's borders will now fall to Saul, not God, where it once did. God had previously protected them. He was the one who thundered from the mountains. He drove the Philistines away. But now it'll be Saul's job. 
And thirdly, he will restrain the people of Israel. That to our ears, I think when I first read that, that sounds a bad thing, doesn't it? He will restrain the people of Israel. But it's actually meant to be a good thing. The idea of restraining them here and restraint here is about stopping God's people wandering away into sin. It's to keep God's people, if you like, on the straight and narrow, going the right way. And it's an idea that's come up in 1 Samuel. So if you're here with us, right back at the beginning, do you remember Eli, an old man who failed to restrain his son's evil and wickedness and ultimately were judged by God? And it's often an idea in the Bible that's used of God. He restrains his people from their sin. If you like, it's like here we see that normally what happens is God is the one who doesn't let his people become as wicked and as evil as they might if they were left to their own devices. We're all prone to wander into our sin, and God knows that. So here, Saul will be appointed as one who will restrain his people. As I read this, one of the things I realise is I think we see God's grace to his people at work. Just at a human level, imagine this, and this isn't that far removed. What does it feel like at a human level when you are rejected, especially for no good reason? Imagine you've been working somewhere, for example, for quite a long time, maybe for a number of years. You've done your job really well, better than anyone expected. And then suddenly everyone turns around and says, you know what, we don't really want you anymore. You don't look the part. You're not the same as everybody else. So we're getting rid of you. In fact, I heard of almost the exact situation with someone in the last fortnight. Someone else they worked with, no real complaints about their work, but they just didn't look the part and look like everyone else at that level. Well, that sense of just being rejected is not dissimilar to what Israel have done to God. It's like they're saying, thanks for rescuing us from Egypt, thanks for giving us this land, for getting rid of the Philistines, for bringing peace and security, for keeping us safe and secure, but you know what, bye-bye. We don't want you, God. We actually want someone who looks more the part like everybody else has got. I don't know about you, but if that was me, and someone did that to me, then I think I'd be finding them the worst possible king I could. <laughs> you know, someone who's proud and arrogant, uh, someone who's going to make life a bit of a nightmare for them, some form of revenge. But here in 1 Samuel 9 and 10, that's not what it looks like is happening, them, happening. It seems like God is giving them a king who at this point, at least, doesn't look like a disaster. Saul, he seems to have a bit of humility, doesn't he? He recognises who he is and his limitations. Someone who will act as a protector, a ruler and a restrainer. God seems to show them some grace in who he appoints. But as well as being chosen by God, we see that Saul is set apart by God. Read with me from verse 26, where we left Saul fast asleep on the roof of the house. Then at the break of dawn, Samuel called to Saul on the roof, Get up, that I may send you on your way. So Saul arose, and both he and Samuel went out into the street. As they were going down to the outskirts of the city, Samuel said to Saul, Tell the servant to pass on before us, and when he had passed on, stop here yourself for a while, that I may make known to you the word of God. Then Samuel took a flask of oil and poured it on his head and kissed him and said, Has not the Lord anointed you to be prince over his people Israel? And you shall reign over the people of the Lord, and you will save them from the hand of their surrounding enemies. And this shall be the sign to you that the Lord has anointed you to be prince over his heritage. When you depart from me today, you'll meet two men by Rachel's tomb in the territory of Benjamin and Zelzar. And they will say to you, The donkeys that you went to seek are found, and now your father has ceased to care about the donkeys and is anxious about you, saying, What shall I do about my son? Then you should go on from their father and come to the oak of Tabor. Three men going up to God at Bethel will meet you there, one carrying three young goats, another carrying three loaves of bread, and another carrying a skin of wine. And they will greet you and give you two loaves of bread, which you shall accept from their hand. After that, you should come to Gibeath Elohim, where there is a garrison of the Philistines. And there, as soon as you come to the city, you'll meet a group of prophets coming down from the high place with harp, tambourine, flute, and lyre before them, prophesying. Here Samuel anoints Saul as king. 
privately first. No one else sees. They send the servant on ahead and he gets the oil, which will be used to set someone apart to anoint them and anoint Saul as the one who will be king. Samuel does it, if you like, on behalf of God. He's God's spokesperson. He acts for God. Saul has never, in this story, had any intention of setting himself up as a king. It's not even clear at this point how Saul become known and is accepted as king. But God has chosen him. God has set him apart. And however it happens, it's clear that God lies behind it. There's a reminder here, isn't there, that God is always sovereignly working, even when we can't join the dots. Even when things go desperately, desperately wrong in Saul's reign later, it doesn't take away from the point that God is behind his appointment. It's a bit like in the New Testament, when the disciples, they see Jesus, don't they, dragged off for his execution. And the questions they will have at that point are legion, aren't they? This man they've walked with, they've thought was the Messiah, the Saviour, is dragged off and executed. And they go, where is God in this? Was this really the Messiah? Was this really God's son? In the middle of the story, in the middle of the story, it can be hard to see God's hand at work. Hard to see how he is in things or behind things. These weird verses in the middle of 1 Samuel 9 were there to make it really clear to Saul and to everybody else who would read this later, that God had chosen Saul. When he met those men, accepted those loaves, came across those things, it was a sign that God was behind it. Because he told him through Samuel what would happen. I think it's worth us remembering that too. That when things sometimes seem to be going backwards, when we don't understand things, it doesn't mean that God is absent even in the midst of our sin and rejection of God, he's still at work. Well, lastly, our last few verses of the reading, we see that Saul is a man who is changed by God. Let's start at verse 6 of chapter 10. Then the Spirit of the Lord will rush upon you, and you will prophesy with them and be turned into another man. Now when these signs meet you, do what your hand finds to do, for God is with you. Then go down before me to Gilgal, and behold, I am coming down to you to offer burnt offerings and to sacrifice peace offerings. Seven days you shall wait until I come to you and show you what you should do. When he turned his back to leave Samuel, God gave him another heart. And all these signs came to pass that day. When they came to Gibeah, behold, a group of prophets met him, and the Spirit of God rushed upon him, and he prophesied among them. And when all who knew him previously saw how he prophesied with the prophets, the people said to one another, What has come over the son of Kish? Is Saul also among the prophets? And a man at the place answered, And who is their father? Therefore it became a proverb, Is Saul also among the prophets? When he had finished prophesying, he came to the high place. Saul's uncle said to him and to his servant, Where did you go? And he said, To seek the donkeys. And when we saw they were not to be found, we went to Samuel. And Saul's uncle said, please tell me what Samuel said to you. And Saul said to his uncle, he told us plainly the donkeys had been found. But about the matter of the kingdom of which Samuel had spoken, he did not tell him anything. God's spirit changes Saul. It makes him a new man, doesn't it? It gives him a new heart. It is God in the end who changes people. For Saul, it happens in this really clear public way as he starts as he starts prophesying, as he starts speaking out God's truth. It's a, it's a slightly odd thing that's going on here. But as far as we can tell, in Israel at the time, they had these groups of prophets, often young men who would gather together, who would come together and they'd speak these kind of ecstatic utterances. And they would sing and they would make music on the high places. And they'd often have an older man amongst them who was called their father. Hence the question, and who is their father? For everyone who knew Saul, this wasn't who he was. He hadn't been a prophet. And no one quite believed it was real. They were asking, what has come over Saul, the son of Kish? What's he doing? The question, is Saul also among the prophets, wasn't supposed to be a nice question. But a bit cutting, a bit of like, who do you think you are? But Saul isn't playing. He isn't pretending. 
He's been changed by the Spirit of God. He's been made into a new person. And his prophesying is a sign of the radical change that's come over him. Saul, the tall, handsome Benjaminite, on the hunt for some lost donkeys for his dad, has been changed by the Spirit of God into a new man, a man who would be king over Israel, chosen, set apart, and equipped by God. What things can we take away from this story? Well, here's two. Two things to take away from this bit of the story. First is this. God doesn't always work as and when we'd expect. And often that's a sign of his grace. God doesn't always work as and when we'd expect. And often that's a sign of his grace. When God's people rejected God back in chapter 8, they deserved God's judgment on them then and there. They deserve God to turn himself away from them and leave them to their own devices, to a king that they chose. But that's not how God is. It's not in his character. It was the same back in the Garden of Eden, of Eden wasn't it? With Adam and Eve, they reject God. It has serious consequences, but even then, God doesn't entirely abandon them. It happens around a campfire years later. As Jesus is being crucified and Peter, one of his closest friends, denies knowing him three times. Yet in every one of those instances, one way or another, God seeks restoration and reconciliation with his people. What we see here in these chapters is a sign of God's grace. God chooses a king. A king who will give way to another king and another and another. So eventually God's son, the true king, would be born. You know, sometimes this can make things difficult for us. Because I think often we kind of expect, or at least sometimes want, and think it would be easier if God acted like some kind of logic machine. You know, do a bad thing, bad consequence immediately, like parenting is often encouraged to be. Do something good, an immediate reward, so we can know what bad and good is. But that's not how God acts. Sometimes we see bad things happening, and we sit there with the questions, don't we? Why does God allow the bad things to happen? Why does God allow his church and his people to, to wander away from him? Why does it seem like sometimes those who live most faithfully see the least fruit and the least blessing in their lives? I can't answer all the ins and outs of those, but we can say this from our passage. That God is still working. He's still acting in his world, even when it's hidden from us. We have an inside track here of what's happening, but no one else around does. No one else can see God's hand other than Samuel and Saul. So one, God is still working. And the second thing we take away from this passage is perhaps we don't, bad things don't always have bad immediate consequences. Perhaps those things do carry on going on because it's because of God's grace. Because actually perhaps he wants others to turn back to him, to follow him, to let him be king over them. Perhaps he's showing other people the same grace that he shows us. Not immediately judging. Not immediately giving us what we deserve, but staying his hand for a time. And even perhaps bringing undeserved blessing despite our sin. We see that going on in this passage in 1 Samuel. It's not to say that God will forever ignore rebellion and sin. The consequences of Israel's rejection become clear later. But not yet. And that ties, I think, to the second thing we can learn from this passage. And this passage is a call for us to trust God's words and his ways, even when we can't see what's going on. In other words, we should have faith. Trust God's words and waves, even when we can't see what's going on. Saul, he starts quite well here, to be honest. We see some humility, don't we? A willingness to seek God. He's attractive, seems to get on with his servant. He's empowered by the Spirit of God, and he's concerned about his father. But, and here's the big but, however good he is, he was never, ever going to be as good um, as a king as God was. God had said if they had a king, a human king, it would end badly. He said that a human king will seek to take the best of what they have for himself and build himself an empire. But the people didn't listen. 
And now, as we get to halfway through chapter 10, if you look at Saul, how easy would it be to think, well, you know what? Saul seems okay. Perhaps it won't be as bad as God said. Perhaps we can have a human king like everyone else and all the blessings of having God as king too. God has said you can't have both, but you could look at Saul here and go, well, maybe we can. Faith trusts God's word, even when we can't yet see it happening. Faith here would have been to know however good Saul looked, it would eventually end badly. But in an odd way, sometimes God's grace makes living by faith hard. But because God is graceful to them, because they don't immediately get a tyrant, because God doesn't just abandon them, it's very easy to start to go doubt God's word about what's coming in the future. It's like when our habit of, say, lying, or any other sin, really, develops in us. Because God doesn't always immediately judge and discipline us, can't we start to think, oh, well, perhaps it's not that bad. Perhaps it's not as bad as God says. Perhaps it doesn't really do any harm. What's the problem with it? And we come to presume upon God's grace, come to stop trusting in his words, what he says is good and bad, his kingship, his lordship. Lots of the discussion around gender and sexuality in the church day probably fit right in that category. So does perhaps our tendency to prioritise ourselves over the weak and the poor and the vulnerable. You know, we keep for ourselves, leave the others to themselves, nothing bad seems to happen, so we just get on with it. <coughs> this passage in Samuel, as we finish, shows us that God hasn't left his world. He is working, even when we can't see it. But the things he says are true and will come true. We need to trust him. So let's not confuse God's grace with a lack of God working in the world. Let me pray and then we'll sing. Lord and Heavenly Father, we thank you that this is your world and you continue to work in it. Father, help us to trust your words. Help us to look to you as our King and Lord. Help us to know that the things that you say are good, are good, and bad, are bad. Uh, Father, when, we, when you're graceful to us, when you don't immediately discipline, when you don't immediately judge, Father, help us not to presume upon that grace, um, but continue to follow and walk after you. Amen. Amen. Let's stand and let's sing together. <laughs>